Hello, welcome to North Wednesday Science Week. I'm here with Eric Walker from the Highlands Astronomical Society. And I'm here with Ollie Gibb from the North Wednesday very sort of just getting going <laughs> Astronomy Society. And I'm here with Howie Firth, the organizer of the Orkney Science International Science Festival. Right. So um, I'm going to start with some questions from North Ronalds Day and, and I've got the first question comes from Sue. Now these are these all these questions are for Eric because he's our he's our experts here. Oh dear. So, <laughs> and and we're sort of asking as sort of people that really don't know much at all. So, so please please correct us when we make rookie errors. So this is a question from Sue and she asks, what equipment do I need to get the best from the night sky? What equipment do you need to get the best from the night sky? Well, the best equipment and the only equipment you actually need are your own eyes. Good okay? answer. Initially, you just want to use your own eyes and get to learn the night sky, get to learn what's up there, the patterns of stars in the sky, uh, the fuzzy objects, the moon, everyone's familiar with the moon. So, you know, use your eyes. The next bit of equipment, and this is probably where her question is starting to come from, is get yourself a pair of binoculars. Um, I personally recommend binoculars. I know that my local astronomy club, the Highlands Astronomical Society, it also recommends people to get binoculars and 8 by 40s, 8 by 50s, 10 by 50s, that order of binocular is the right size. Binoculars are easy to use. You point them at the sky at what you want to point them at. It's easy done. The sky is the right way up. What you see is what you get. And when you use binoculars, it is absolutely amazing what a pair of relatively low power binoculars will let you see. You start to see stars as jewels in a, a black velvet sky. It's just wonderful. Lovely curves of stars, chains of stars, little clusters. Um, features on the moon become visible. You can see the moon behind in my background. Your binoculars start to let you see it like that, without the colours, but uh, yeah. Then, Perhaps once you get to know the sky a little bit more, then progress to a low powered telescope. Um, you can get refractors, you know, which have got lenses in them, and you have reflectors, which are curved mirrors. Both capture the light, um, but they focus it in a slightly different way. Um, but as you start to progress in types of equipment, you start digging a little bit deeper into your pockets. So you have to be aware of that. Um, yeah, then if you really get keen, you can start to take photographs. So another way of observing the sky is to observe it with like a low power telescope and a camera or a camera and very good, you know, lenses, you know, um, you can get anything from wide angle lenses, telephoto lenses, but again, as the equipment gets a bit more sophisticated, be prepared to dig deep into those pockets. <laughs> and one of the things, that, another thing I would recommend in that case is if you are fortunate enough to have uh, a local astronomy club, get in touch with them because they have a range of equipment which they're only too willing to let people use and that way you get uh, you, you get to test equipment, see what's suitable for you. You also do not dig too deep into those pockets. And you will also find that amateur astronomers are just so willing to teach and coach people. So I hope that helps, uh, helps Sue with her, with her question. Oh, that, that was a great answer. That was a great answer, Eric. You're absolutely right. I, I you know, when, when you did your moon talk last week, I was out with the... Um, 
uh, binoculars afterwards and seeing the moon was incredible and I could see the crater you mentioned um, oh, Copernicus, Copernicus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and then I was looking at the dog star as well and that was that was just amazing yeah, Sirius was beautiful actually oh, was the, Sirius stunning. is better when the amateur astronomy conditions aren't correct because it twinkles more and it <sighs> refracts more and it changes the colour right through all the colours of the rainbow oh, rapidly and brightly. I thought um, I was hallucinating. I just couldn't believe it. It's it all those mushrooms so and Yeah. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I have another question from Sue. What books do you recommend for us beginners? Please. Books. Now, there's a question of today, isn't it? It's interesting because usually I get asked, what website would you go to <laughs> or which app would you use? But uh, books, yeah, I still do use books. I still, um, when you're out in the field um, and you can't get a signal on your phone or whatever, I still have a pocket book. Now, I'm talking about observing books. Okay, these are books for observing. And I have an old book, which has been on the go for a lot of years and there's plenty of revisions. I don't know whether you can see this. Oh, yeah. A Collins Gem book. Now, well, I think most of us, Howie and I certainly will remember all, there's a huge amount of Collins Gem series about just about every subject under the sun. Um, this is Collins Gem Stars, and it has, um, you, you can look at different constellations, and it has little star maps, and on this page, little, uh, little descriptions of features, star clusters, or whatever to look at. Um, you can stick that in your back pocket. It's also made of a type of paper that if it gets slightly damp, it's actually, it seems to survive. So the Collins Gem books really are in the field pocket books. And I know people, when we were at the, looking at the, uh, the doing the Orkney Science Festival last year, the foraging festival people, they often recommended similar books uh, to, to this when they yeah. were out um, trying to identify what's right for you and what's good and what's not so good, yeah. So that's one. Um, another book, and this is slightly, sorry, it's, uh, this book, this is another book, this one is slightly bigger and it will probably fit in the inside of a jacket pocket. Yeah. But that one, that one is actually, that is also good. It has slightly bigger maps and it has pictures in it, which everyone loves. <laughs> I, I like pictures. Um, and that's another good book. So that is, uh, that's a, a, D, a, a DK uh, Dorling Kindersley Handbook uh, by a guy called Ian Ridpath and Ian's uh, a well-recognised practical uh, astronomer. Uh, he wrote this and uh, this is again is a well-recognised book to have in your you, you, if, if you're observing from your home or something Alex, you mm -hmm. know have that sitting just at the porch or something before you go out Yes. Um, or, or in your back, you know, if you're observing for your back garden, you don't have to go far afield in some places. Certainly not at Ronald's, I wouldn't expect you have to go very far. No, it's just um, outside the back door. <laughs> there you go. So have that book, have that book sitting. And then, of course, you start to get, um, if you're starting to, you know, really take things a bit more serious, you, mm. you get a thing like the Atlas of the Night Sky by, again, this well known Storm Dunlop and Will Turnin and uh, Antonin Rukel, they are illustrators and uh, these maps are, they're, they're starting to become more, uh, they're more what I'd call astronomers maps, yeah. but they're amateur astronomers maps, they're not difficult. So there's three books, however I did start by saying I do now tend to get asked, um, I tend to get asked what, what website would you use, well you just honestly use Google and things and you'll find information of what's in the night yeah. sky wonderful apps um we did a we did a, a, a astronomy club we did a live observing webcast of the moon last week and we were using a an app to help us find our way around the moon called uh virtual moon atlas mm -hmm. so you can download that for free to your laptop or to your you know smartphone or tablet or whatever and oh, it's got incredible detail. It's easy to use. Um, it's intuitive. I, you know, the ones that have been designed by um, amateur astronomers are always the best because they're, they're designed from a practical uh, aspect, practical users aspect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
I hope that helps. That was brilliant. I've sort of messed up the order of the questions a bit, so sorry. No I'm going to, I'm, you can I'm edit going, them together I, in any way you wish. Yes. If if I ask the next one, Howie, and then and then you take the one after that, is that okay? And I, I think I think we've just lost Ollie for a moment as well. So this is a question from Sarah, and she says, "Are there a list of key dates or events in astronomy throughout the year? For example, annual meteor showers." Ah yes, yes. You th there are there are. Uh, uh, you'll get these again in the, there's another book <laughs> that uh, I happen to, I always get, I get it as a Christmas present, usually from yes. my wife and my daughter, and it's this Phillips book, 2021 oh. Stargazing. Okay. So it's specific to each year? Yes, yeah, and uh, it's not, it's about a fiver or six quid, although I think, you, yeah. you know, if you go online you'll always get them at a discount, um, but this has a, a page in it called highlights of the year Ooh. okay yes. which mm. i think is exactly what sarah's uh, asking. i think she, i think it is indeed and it has you know for example it starts off on the third of fourth of january yeah. the maximum of the quant quadrant meteor shower and it has the perseid shower dates and the geminid shower dates but it also has things events uh, specific to that particular year for example just now um, this is, well, we're in what, the, the beginning of March. Uh, 5th of March, Mercury passes very close to Jupiter. Now, we can't see that this far north oh, because Jupiter's right. just way too low. But, you know, people down in England, south of England, will see it, no bother. However, 19th of March, the moon lies very near to Mars in the vicinity of the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, or yeah. Deborah, that's the red eye of the bull in Taurus, and the Hyades, which is the the V-shaped open cluster in Taurus. So, yes, there are highlights. There's plenty of information. And again, not just in this type of book, but if you go on to uh, BBC Sky at Night um, yes. website, um, there are magazines, ma monthly magazines. They'll tell you what to look for in the year and, and in the month. What are the best things to look for? What's the best things to look for naked eye? Best things binocular, best things small mm. telescope, best things large telescope. So there's plenty of information there. Um, in fact, there's, there's probably a lot more information than you think. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. And Howie, can I go over to you for the next question, please? Yes, thank you very much, um, Alex and, and Eric. It's a, a question about um, the international dark sky status and the potential of that with the, the North Ronald Sea application shortly to go in. The potential of that to attract winter sky watchers, not only to the island itself, but to the rest of Orkney. And I was just wondering, would we need to be thinking now about things that might be needed to be provided for them? I think you do, uh, Howie, if, if, if what you've just said is uh, uh, you're, you're not far away from getting uh, being given that status, then I think you really, yes, you do need to think about it. It's interesting you said, uh, you know, from a winter um, sky observing uh, time, I actually believe you can extend that. I mean, I know that, uh, um, you know, you, you have very, very long summer days, but I would be guessing that by early October mm. your, your nights are starting to draw in and certainly by the uh, by the equinox your nights are starting to come in really fast so it's probably a late it's probably a, a late autumn right yeah. through to um, end of March I, I think it's longer so I, I you know maybe don't limit yourself to just a few weeks in winter you know so, so you, you need to be thinking about what period, what time of year are we going to really promote this? Mm -hmm. Where am I going to promote it? Websites, astronomy magazines, astronomy clubs. You know, there are there are masses and masses of I know at least UK based astronomers who would give their eye teeth to be able to come to somewhere as dark as uh, North Ronaldson. I mean, I've been up there a couple of times and it's just a wonderful, it's a wonderful place, but it's got beautiful dark skies, which is why you're going for that. Um, what facilities would you need? Well, accommodation is one. Um, yeah, we have that. Accommodation or places to park a tent. 
um, um, but I know it can be a bit breezy sometimes, but um, uh, so yeah, accommodation. Uh, when people are observing, they either need power, well, electrical power, or they need a place during the day where they can charge up their battery packs and things like that. Okay. To ensure, so that, that's the detail. Yeah. I'm going into the detail here with this answer. Yeah. I'm probably it's probably probably no, no, too it's much all good detail stuff. for uh, for for for. for Maybe for this, but uh, um, having a place uh, to shelter, right? It, we all know the weather can be great for periods of time, but we live in Scotland. We we live on a big island, and we live on small archipelago islands as well. And the weather can shift rapidly. It can be great one minute, and it can be awful the next. So you need a place to actually be able to um, come out of the bad weather, protect right. the equipment. The equipment people take, they may take their own equipment. That's another thing you need to think of. Yeah. Are, are people bringing their own equipment to us here on North of Ronald, say? Um, or are they using our equipment? Um, because that's another whole heap of different business plan you need to consider. Um, but whosever equipment it is, you need to protect it. So if yeah. you get a squall coming in, um, you need to be able to protect it quickly. But you also need to be able to set up quickly again. Yes. And as a fact, astronomers, if they're astrophotographers, it can take an hour or so to set up your equipment as precisely as you require to take the quality of pictures you need. The last thing you want to be doing is actually dismantling your kit and then reset the um, setting it up again. So, yeah, uh, how to shelter, protect uh, equipment. I don't have a solution immediately off the top of my hand. I'm sure there are other people who know there are dark sky areas in Galloway and in Wales and things like that. So they must have gone through similar to, to, to you. Yeah. That, I'm only, I only talked about UK based. There are worldwide people interested in it. And you also know that there are people who love to come to Orkney, uh, you know, to, to do almost like heritage tours or whatever. Um, they can also take time out to come across to North Rowan and spend a couple of nights doing a, you know, uh, an observing experience yeah. in beautiful, pristine dark skies. You know? yeah. Well, that's definitely something to think about because we, we were sort of wondering if we needed to sort of have some sort of structure. Yeah. <laughs> well, we sort of can't imagine what it's like, really. Building a small observatory. That's an option for you. Oh, well, I'll listen to this tape again then and get the name of that. No, what was but, it but called? It is, you know, it's building a small observatory. Yes. You know? um, mm. But not necessarily, the trouble with the observatory, you have to be careful because you might tend to go for like one bit of kit. Whereas astronomers tend to use a range of equipment, you know. Yeah. It's, it's very tempting to go for one, like a big telescope. Yeah. But you know what? That's maybe not the best idea. It's maybe have an observatory where you have. Um, you're able to set up a range of equipment, you know, and draw a roof over it when, uh, you know, someone, the weather's going bad or whatever. But big scopes, small scopes, refractors, mm -hmm. reflectors, it's actually useful to have a range of equipment. Yes. Yeah, that, that sounds great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think, Ollie, are you there? No, I don't, I don't think Ollie's here. Um, Howie, do you want to ask your question next? Yes, I had one. It's it's a kind of general one. It's starting. It's just that when I open the the, the door and, and look look outside, there's a, a mass of stars, and I wonder how do I start? So my question, Eric, is really how do you gradually build up knowledge of the the night sky so that after a while it starts to to feel familiar and you can find your way around on your own. Yeah, you know, that's actually, that's an excellent, that truly is an excellent question. Because if you get lost, whether that be in the sky or out on a forest walk or a hill walk, your enjoyment suddenly becomes one of dismay or even panic in certain situations. Um, you do need to be able to work out where you are in the night sky and where you're going to go to. <laughs> that's really I think what you're asking me yeah um, 
I can give you, I can tell you how I did it. And mine was, was simply starting off by identifying the very, very popular or well-known constellations or asterisms. And I'm talking about a constellation you will have heard of Orion, you know, or perhaps um, Cygnus the Swan. You will have heard of an asterism called the Plough. You know, or the, the, the Big Dipper, or in French, the Le Grand Casserole, <laughs> as they call it. You learn those shapes and patterns and where they are in the sky relative to each other. And you grad and you learn the bright ones first, Howie. Don't go trying to find the faint ones. There are many faint patterns and you go, I can't see what the heck they're talking about. Go for the easy ones and get your confidence up. And the other ones are that are like the, like the asterism, the plough. Um, I've heard someone describe that as the Swiss army knife of asterisms. Mm. You can use combinations of stars in that asterism. The two end ones are called the pointer stars. You extend an imaginary line straight up and you find the pole star. You extend one from the bottom left star to the top right star in the bowl of the plough. And you find two galaxies called the Cigar Galaxy uh, and Bode's Galaxy. You extend the arc of the plough, the tail, and you arc down towards a bright red star called Arcturus. So you learn those constellations and asterisms and they open up the sky. They become your root map. Initially they become a big map and then they become a route map. It's, 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 it's a matter of practice. It's working at it. How you, there's no, and there is no shortcut. Oh. If you're looking for a shortcut, you've had it. Right? Half the fun, a lot of the fun is in actual fact, being able to identify areas of the sky through those constellations and asterisms. And it's actually quite satisfying when you're out in the sky with someone who doesn't know anything about it and you point out there and go, oh, there's Cygnus the Swan, uh, you know, there's Taurus the Bull and the Seven Sisters, also known as Subaru, you know, you know and uh, you've seen the logo on a car, car bonnet, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, you know, it's, there's something nice about doing that, let's be honest, yeah. That's great. That was great, thank you. Right, I've, I've got two more questions, if that's okay. Um, first one is, please can you tell me about your planetarium and equipment? My planetarium and equipment. Well, Alex, I don't have a planetarium. I do, <laughs> I do, I do have an observatory. Yeah. A planetarium. Um, yeah. that's, that's a place you go uh, where uh, they'll have them in like, um, like Glasgow, you know, Glasgow Science uh, Exhibition uh, uh, place where you go inside it and they project the sky on a curved roof, a curved ceiling. And... Uh, you know, they, 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 they do a show, you know, they show you certain features and um, how the sky moves or how it was 10,000 years ago and what it looks like today. That's a, that's a planetarium, that's an artificial sky uh, theatre, mm. for want of a better word. I have an observatory uh, in my back garden, in fact, and uh, I built it or assembled it myself. And it's a, it's a 1.8 metre diameter dome. The dome rotates and it has a shutter which you open up and down so I can point it at certain segments of the sky and I can shut out any light pollution or I can, I'm just focusing on one narrow area um, of the sky. Uh, in that observatory, which is permanently mounted, of course, is, I, have, I have a big 11 inch diameter um, reflecting telescope. Now that's a fair size for a, a, an amateur uh, astronomer. And it's on a mount, it's on a big steel mount that's solidly mounted onto a big concrete block so it doesn't move. Um, that block is actually isolated from another concrete floor so that when I walk around it, I don't put any vibrations into it because I do astrophotography and the last thing I want is any shaking or shuggling to spoil my images. Uh, the mount is it's polar aligned. That means it is perfectly aligned to the um, axis and the angle of, that, that the Earth is at. Anyone who has built a, 
uh, a sundial will know that you have to build the gnome on the, you know, the angle, the angle that's uh, pointing towards the sun or away from the sun. That has to be at the exact angle that your latitude is. And it's exactly the same principle that's extended towards setting up a telescope such as I have. And it has to be absolutely uh, precisely, precisely done. So it took me a long while to get that right. It's now bolted down and it will never move. Um, so that's there. I have all kinds, because I astrophotography is my main astronomy passion, I have pretty sophisticated astronomy cameras. They have great big uh, uh, chips in them, big sensors, so they capture a lot of light, um, a lot of area. And they're high resolution, they're cooled down to minus 20 degrees C, so I get hardly any noise from electrical interference from the kit. Um, but I take it serious. Yes. <laughs> right, so do not, but somebody asked the question earlier, what equipment do I need? Yeah, don't go for that equipment right away. <laughs> That's taken years to get there. Um, uh, and you have to know that that is your passion because, you know, it's not, that is not, be perfectly honest that's not a cheap it's not a cheap thing to do uh, how I can did you throw... get the top the dome it was oh. that was that pre is that pre-made yeah. is that something you buy yeah yeah there are i i actually did i did make an observatory my own observatory with a, a rotating dome and yeah. my very first one i did i made it out of wood i actually recycled everything i, I got stuff uh, it was very very little new stuff i bought i bought, made it out of wood and i made the dome i made a geodesic dome Oh, yes, of course. Out of plywood. Right. Geodesic is one of the few shapes that as you build it bigger, it gets actually stronger or more sturdy. Um, you may see them, you, people will recognise that you get greenhouses that are, yes. or, 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 of that shape. And I think the, the, Eden, um, the Eden Project down in, in England, I think a, a lot of that's geodesic. Um, so I made it out of that. Tri lots of different triangles and it makes pentagons and hexagons and you make this half dome shape uh, and then I covered it in paper mashi and painted it with boat paint basically <laughs> to keep it waterproof and it worked for years and years and years but eventually I did go for a pre-built one nice. uh, which you, there are a couple of companies in the UK make them and I went for one of them um, and it's it, it does the job it's perfect there's my observatory Okay, so that's, that's your, the dome. You, see, you notice the pod at the yes. right hand side, right? I now have three of those. They give, they allow me to put my computer equipment in and uh, storage equipment so I can store all the kit I need. It doesn't get in my way when I walk around inside the dome. So I've, I've got, you know, lots more actual usable space in it. <coughs> There's the scope. So a big scope. That's the, there's a special mount. That's the mount that you have to get to the right angle. And that's the big steel pier that's mounted on, on top of a concrete block. This is just types of kit oh, that I've goodness. got. Yeah, and there's a list. Um, another important thing, Alex, is all these filters that I have. Because yeah. I filter in narrow band, it uh, means I select, you know, like the hydrogen <coughs> wavelengths so I can if you're looking at like the Orion Nebula masses of them hydrogen beta and oxygen is good but there's also sulfur areas in some nebula and uh, they're interesting areas as well because bear in mind we're all made of star stuff right there's an astro cam it's uh, quite you know it's a pretty sophisticated bit of kit but essential if you're doing the star here's another bit of kit I've gone off-piste here, by the way. I told you I would go off-piste. Oh, right. no, please go ahead, yeah. Um, in the lockdown, right, I got, well, not bored is the wrong word, but um, I, I, I can't stand just sitting on my hands. And I built an all-sky camera. All right, so it allows you to see, you know, north, south, east, west, horizon to horizon. Uh, and it takes a picture every 35, 45 seconds and assembles it in a time-lapse over the night. Uh, I can pick up meteors, fireballs, ball aids, oh. all kinds of things uh, with this. And you get star patterns, star trails in the morning. Um, so talk about innovation. 
there's, yeah. a, there's innovation. I didn't of invent course. it. I just sorry, I didn't innovate it from scratch. There was a guy, Thomas Yaquin in Yukon in Canada, put the project up on the internet, free for everyone. And I took that and I adapted it for my particular um, use. So that's a great thing. And that's been, that's popular. That's actually anyone, anyone can go into that URL there and, and view it. It's, for, it's, it's mine, yeah, but it's yeah. public access. It's down for maintenance at the moment. I'm sorting that out. There's a star trail. Okay. I'm not going to go through all these because that's, it was just the, right. Anyway, that's, uh, yeah, so I'll stop the share. But that was to give you an idea of the observatory, Alex. That's what I was trying to, so it's, it's easy to talk about it, but I realise when I was talking about it that people might not know what I was actually describing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, that was actually very, very interesting. Thank you. Right. Okay. I think we're on to the last question now, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a light one. When we were talking last week about the moon, you were saying that, you know, how we, we in the UK say we see the man in the moon, but in Japan, they see the rabbit. And I was just trying to figure out, I was trying to see this rabbit. <laughs> yeah, can you, can you it's interesting because see, once I, I'm going to show you this, Alex, yeah. right? because we all get brought, we do, we get brought up uh, from primary school, age, less than the preschool age, because I'm sure our parents and grandparents teach us to look for the man in the moon. Mm -hmm. And you learn to see it, mostly. But once you get taught the rabbit in the moon, you will not, un well, in my opinion, you will not unsee the rabbit in the moon. <laughs> Because I think it looks much more like a rabbit in the moon than it does um, a man in the moon. Now, I have, I downloaded a few pictures. So I am going to, I'm going to share my screen again, Alex. Thank okay? you. And uh, show you this. Right, let me just do this for you. Right, the man in the moon. Can you see that? Yes, yes. That is what we get taught. You know, look for, you know, these big maris, these seas. You know, these are like, uh, you know, they're volcanic plains, but they're high. They've got high iron and titanium content, so they look darker than the highlands uh, of the moon. And there are these big patches, and those two are the, one and two are the eyes, and three and four for, a, you know, like a nose, and five and six, like, looks like a big mouth. You know, so that's that's the way we get brought up with the, mm -hmm. the man in the moon. And here's a, here's a schematic that I, I found. And uh, there's the man in the moon. See the one I'm circling yeah. there? That's what we get taught. But there are various uh, people. There, there's one here, right? I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lady. See the lady in the moon? I don't know if yes. you can see her face. Looking yes, I do. forlornly yeah. for our man that's left her. You know, up there, you know, up there. But here is the rabbit. Oh, yes. Right? Now, I don't quite see it like that. I see the rabbit's ears like that. Yeah. But I see its body. I think that's the front of its body, and that's its bunny tail there, you see? So yes. I see it slightly differently, but I definitely see the ears and the yes. rabbit head and face. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, honestly, I think that is much easier to pick out. See, when you're looking at it, next time it's uh, starting to get nearly full, have a look for that and you'll yes. you won't see the man in the moon again you know there, there's there's a there's a full moon look look there's the rabbit you're seeing no problem yes yeah i've got them yep yeah now there are others this is another japanese depiction but they see that so the rabbit's actually kind of it's almost standing up see it yeah and that is like a that's like a cooker of some sort you know or a container and um, there's a japanese name for that particular type of vessel but uh, so some people see it, you know, they see it as that. Okay. But I see it, as I say, with the, I see the, that's the rabbit ears and head and belly and back. Yes. And that's its tail. So we all see it slightly different. Different. I'm seeing that. I'm seeing that woman a lot now. <laughs> I ah, see her more. Well, I see yeah. her most. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the human brain is fascinating <laughs> for seeing patterns and shapes yes. and things. Yes. Um, not because we just happen to be good at it, but it helped us survive. And, uh, you, you know, we, we either recognize something that's chasing us and get away from it, or we see it as, oh, there's food, we can go and hunt it and get it, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a camouflaged background. That's, that's, that's what we're good at. Yeah. 
Well, that, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Eric. I learned loads. And thank you, Harry, as well. That was, that was excellent. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I can't wait, one, till I get back to Orkney International Science Festival in the flesh, Harry, and also to visit North Ron again. Oh, yes, please. Always welcome. <laughs>